Hello, hello out there. Max here, co-founder and chief growth officer at Influx Marketing. And today we're at the Aesthetic Society meeting here at the Miami Beach Convention Center. This is the annual meeting of the American Society for Aesthetic Plastic Surgery. Every year I walk the aisles and I end up spending most of my time chatting with industry peers and marketing minded physicians. And I always walk away really feeling like I have my finger on the pulse of what's happening in our space. So this year, I thought it'd be fun to take it a step further and have those same discussions that I always find myself having but do it in a podcast format so that I can bring them to you at home. So if you're like me and you wanna be dialed in on what's happening within the world of patient acquisition and digital marketing for aesthetic practices, follow along and I hope to bring you some valuable insights through these conversations that you can use to take your practice to the next level. Can't take myself seriously. All right, let's roll with it. Okay, and we're back, and now I'm joined by Jason Johnson, who is the founder and owner of Simple Studios, and I'm going to have him tell you about what he does because we just met, and I found it particularly fascinating, and it's something that I think the industry really needs, so I'm going to introduce him here and let him tell you a little bit about it. Jason, thank you so much for joining us. Hey, Max, thanks for having me. Of yeah. course. So as people are going to find out, you spent a lot of time on the other side of camera, as you were just telling me, and you told me this is kind of a, a new experience for you being... This is really weird. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's a little easier than I thought, but it's still weird because I'm always behind the cameras and monitoring audio and whatever it takes, you know. Well, I like it. You're getting your your day in the sun is finally here. No, well, I just want to help tell this story. Um, and so let me let me not jump the gun here and let you tell us a little bit about what Simple Studios does. Simple Studios uh, helps that that problem that every practice, or I should say, ninety percent of the practices have out there, and that's before and after photography. How to take it. Um, there's too many settings on the camera. There's lenses. There's heights. There's angles. There's lights. There's distances. What do you, how do you fix that? Um, so I've combined the last say nine years of professional photography in this space, um, helping out pharma companies, and I put that into a package that can go into any space uh, for any practice, whether it's a multi-use room or it's a dedicated photo room. And we can customize a photo solution that will get consistently beautiful photos every time. That's, That's such a compelling, is. compelling value proposition, I have to say. Um, I got into doing marketing for aesthetic practices about 11, 12 years ago. One of the first early websites I worked on was a med spa in Beverly Hills that was just getting started. And we were just kind of deeply involved in everything helping them write phone scripts. So, you know, at the end of the day, it, the, the effective marketing relies on so many other things. You need to make sure that people at the front desk know what they're doing when it when the lead calls. You also need to make sure that those photos that are coming onto the website are, you know, we know from our analytics, that's where everyone goes to right, right away and where they spend the most time on a website. Absolutely. And those need to be consistent. And we could talk a lot about that, but um, we even... At that time, we're helping to train people on, on on before and after photos, buying equipment, but it's all, first of all, it's evolving all the time, and secondly, there's a lot to know, and I think it needs to be done by someone who's a specialist. You mentioned you have a career in doing media production, photo and video for pharma, so you're obviously an expert on this kind of, on the on the actual technical I think aspect. So. Yeah, yeah, I guess it's kind of weird to, to think of it like that, like a professional, but but when you kind of tally up the the hours, the years, and the amount of patients that you've photographed and the amount of people you've interviewed, um, you kind of get to that point. Um, and then it's it's everything back in the studio of all the testing that I've done with different lights, different scenarios. So um, a room this size, when you've got, you know, say four foot by seven foot, how do you deal with that? What type of lights? How big are they? What distance? What angle? And then what type of camera system do you put in? I mean, there's, there's so many variables. Um, so I, I've used my professional side with the photo and video and then morphed it together. That's and cool. uh, yeah, it, I, I still love it. I'm willing to bet you put in your 10,000 hours. Yeah, I think so. Whatever that, that it takes to I, come. I think it's 10,000 hours, yeah. Yeah, I think so I think you can call yourself an expert. Yeah. We've even toyed around with it, but it's not our it's not our specific do area of domain expertise. Should we, should we, long ago, I was speaking with my business partners and do we, do we help do something to help make this consistent? Maybe right. come up with a package, do something. But I really think partnering with someone like yourself would make the most sense. And like you said, there's no one size fits all package. So being able to kind of go in there and tailor a solution yeah. with the nimble thinking of actually understanding what all this equipment does is what's so key. So when I met you today and I found out that's what you do and you're going around to these practices and setting this up, I immediately like a light bulb went off for me. 
first of all, let's sit down and talk on the podcast and let's talk more about how we can refer clients your way because, man, when they give us good photos... Uh, it makes your life easier. It's life-changing. Yeah. And we spent a long time developing proper solutions for a really great gallery, um, web gallery, but, you know, what? It's still, it still relies on those inputs and what we get given. Yeah. And it's hard sometimes to educate them on if it's cropped this way or taken this way, I can't crop it consistent to that. You know, right. We have workflows and things to do to, to make it look as to do it quickly because we're processing oftentimes, sometimes thousands of photos. Right. Um, but also we do our best to make it look good. But I just got to see, I got to see a setup that he has set up here at the show. And it's really impressive. It's this really cool cart with, uh, Ex excellent lens on the front and then the iPad on the back to be able to kind of see and ghost and guide the image. What do you call that? So that's the Shuttle Pro. Cool. Um, yeah, it's got uh, a laptop tray if you're going to use a laptop. Cool. Um, I, I love the Touch ND software using the Snap Canon Connect um, uh, software system for it. And I have the iPad mounted to the back of the cart so you can just pull up the patient chart. Um, take the photo from it so you can see it. You can ghost in images. You can use the Snap Pro, which has the ghosting features um, and and grid lines on there. Um, the DSLR is just really just used as a lens and there's nothing to it. It's kind of a dumb device in that situation, but it's just got the best lens. Um, it slides up and down. It's weightless on, on the uh, Shuttle Pro. That's great for a, a, a good size room. You know, you need at least like say six foot by nine foot, something mm -hmm. like that. That's a that's that's a pretty good size room to have. But we have other devices for smaller rooms. Um, I saw that video. So mount from the ceiling. Yep, we've got that. Um, and in the last couple of months, I've developed uh, another one, which I don't. I need I need to get like some sort of contest for naming it because I don't okay. know the name. But it mounts to the wall. It has the same slider system, but it will um, still allow the same quality photos, but it's 11 inches off the wall. And so you just have to look at the, you kind of look at your iPad and the camera's pointed this direction. So that's for really small, small, small rooms. Okay. Where the ceiling may not work for various reasons. Ceiling doesn't work. The floor doesn't work. Okay. Like it, it, there's just some odd situations. Well, that's what I love is you adapt it for each scenario. It really makes a lot of sense. So you have Shuttle Pro. What's the ceiling one called? The other? Balance Pro. Is it like a slim? So, you know, I think of I think of t the terminology that TV companies use for their really flush wall mounted, slim mounted. I think right. something in there, right? Because and that's really what it is. Because it, you know, I, I developed the products based off of the need. So, uh, Doctor Trussler out of Austin, Texas, I've done two photo rooms for him. His second one was a Rhino room, and he says I want to do nothing but Rhino consultations in there. Can you make something that pulls out of the ceiling? I'm like, well, yeah. Doc, you know I can build anything. Yeah, that's so, so let's cool. Let's do it. So uh, a couple weeks later, I, I sent him a note. I said, yeah, I got something. He said, okay, I'll fly you out. So I went out there and I installed it, and he still uses it. That was version one of what you saw, the photos of the Balance Pro. Um, but it all comes from necessity. So as we're growing uh, as a business, we're finding out new needs. And like I said, you know, a month ago, really small location. The door was positioned on the wrong side of this room, so I could not put the balance. Right, just nothing would work in there. So, we've come up with what I'm calling internally the Wally because it's a wall mounted, right? Okay, I like it. Slim, I like Flush uh, Mount Pro, the Slim Pro. I don't know. There's something there, but yeah, I would look. Yeah, what the TV companies do because they're all. That's been a you know huge value prop is look how how slim I can make it against the wall. And, and yeah, could be a terrible idea. I'll, I'll I'll join your contest when you when you uh, officially. Yeah, I got to put that out there. So. Yeah. So yeah, so you also get involved in the software. That's what it, you know. You mentioned TouchMD. If they have recommendations on so, or if they're looking for guidance on the software that they should be using, is that something you get involved in? Yeah, yeah. Um, because I've worked with the practices so closely, I understand the need to move fast. Um, some of these practices, they have you know nine to thirteen rooms, and they've got to be cranking through these BNA photos. They don't have time to sit there and and do certain things behind the camera, right? So. Um, I've tried to suggest a handful of ideas that will speed that up. And some of those are in development now, and, and uh, you guys have to wait to see that. But it will speed up the efficiency and accuracy that nobody else has touched on in the industry, uh, nobody on the software side. So I'm really excited for those developments to come through, and the dev team's working on that right now. That's exciting. So you're, it sounds like your partnership with uh, TouchMD is a little bit more official than maybe some of the other platforms where you've worked really 
in lockstep to, to build something that's very integrated with what they do. Yeah. Yeah. That was really intentional. Um, I, I had reached out in the past to a couple other, uh, software companies and, um, just didn't really work out. Um, the connection wasn't there. Um, but I, when I reached out to TouchMD and, uh, Carrie Smith, the CEO, um, we hit it off. I love their software. It's intuitive, easy to use, and it does what you need to do. And it does it fast. And I always wanted to be able to complete the package, you know, my photo studio package with software. And at the very least, I want to recommend, I want to have a very hot lead for somebody. I don't want to leave them with, um, hey, good luck looking for a software company, because that is exhausting going through demos and, and hoping and wishing. So um, it was really great to, to get this partnership going with them. And, uh, you know, it's... It, we're just best friends. That's what it is. So our companies are best friends. Right I love now. that. And we're helping each other out and we're just uh, elevating each other. Totally. It's a better experience for the client, for, the, for yeah. the end user, because rather than you built them a perfect, amazing, custom-built photo booth for and after photo booth, they don't have to pop out an SD card and then figure out what to yeah. do with it after that. Now, all of a sudden, by working closely with TouchMD, you have, it's already right there in the cloud immediately yeah. after taking it, right? Yeah, yeah. Immediately, it's it's in it's archived in in their uh, their album, and you can access it anywhere in the practice on any other iPad. So it, it's super easy to use. I, uh, I can't tell you the difference between the like the iPhone is an integrated camera to you know, and I know there are cloud connected DSLRs and so forth. But just right. how much quicker you end up using those things on social media because it's already there. Yeah, connected to the cloud yeah. versus I got to get it off a card, and just that small gap can change a lot. So being fully integrated makes a ton of sense. Yeah. How, I'm curious how you started, because I know you just mentioned, how long have you been doing this with TouchMD, kind of that best friend friendship? Um, yeah, thing? Uh, about three years. Cool. Yeah. But you must have been doing this before. You said you were you you were doing it and you wanted to find a, a software partnership. How did you kind of get into doing this in the first place, kind of consulting or building custom photo booths for yeah. practices? That, uh, that came in 2014 when I started working with Allergan launching Baluma. I was taking all their before and after photos for the, uh, the training sessions that Dr. Mauricio De Mayo was putting on. And so I traveled with Mauricio and, and the Allergan team for two years, from 2014 to 16. We did 56 cities around the U.S. Wow. And in each city, we would do between three to five days, sometimes one or two days if it was a quick one. Um, we would be taking six patients a day, and I would take their photos in the morning and then their afters in the afternoon. Um, so that was the beginning of it, and that's when I was meeting the doctors. They would see my photos, and they would take me aside and say, hey, Jason, do you think you can fly out and fix up my studio? Our, or, our, our photos are horrible. I said, well, yeah, I can build anything. I mean, I've got a background of developing products, and, and I love photography, so let's do it. So I'd fly out, set up their room, and then it was just one after another, word of mouth. So I've been doing this word of mouth for nine years or so, and it wasn't until... I don't know, maybe a, a year or two ago, I started thinking, okay, I need to turn this into a business. I think it's time. And I've just taken my time building it up. And then in, say, the, like the last six months, I've really been ramping it up and, and making myself known in public to everybody. So, I know. I was going to say, how after nine fun. years, we've been in this space a similar amount of time, and I've never met. And this is always a pain point, not just the photos, the, yeah. a lot of the pain points that the software solves, but the original input yeah. and the consulting that people need. And I, like I said, we always try to help, but it's there's only so much we can do without it really being an in-depth process and custom building and yeah. and the right recommendations. Yeah. So I'm so glad we met, and that's super cool. Uh, kind of how you got into it. I, I think it's worth t telling us a little bit more about your background. You said you were traveling with Allergan, um, and you mentioned earlier doing media production and and asset creation for Pharma. What, yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about your background there. So. Um I think during the two years, they started to see that I, I knew what I was doing. So I, I bumped off of that and started working um, on some other video projects with them, uh, kind of light interviews, that sort of thing. Um, and then once uh, Kybella started to become a thing, then I went over and did a Kybella shoot. Uh, I think it was 10 months, four patients, two up north in, in California and two in Pasadena, actually. Um, so I did that for quite a while. And that was that was an internal photo shoot. That wasn't like nobody saw those photos, I don't think. Um, although sometimes I've taken photos I didn't think were going to be published, and I see them in books that are in the offices and, and on you know ads and whatnot. Um, so I did some Kybella. 
We did uh, Botox in uh, Juvederm Mix photos. We did those with models. Um, and let me see, did some uh, cool sculpting before and after, and then moved on to uh, Ebelis. Uh, what was that, 2018, 19? And so. Went over to Ebelis and shot all of their um, all of their product photography and all of their model photography. So um, I had to capture, uh, let me see if I get the numbers right, uh, nine models, 14 months. Um, so we started with the day zero, day three, seven, 14, 30, and then we went every month on. And then we randomly brought on new uh, models, but uh, did that campaign shoot. So everything you see on their website and brochures, that's that's what I shot. Um, that's and they awesome. also went over to Revance and, and started shooting for them. Um, we did a, a lot of work around the world with um, where I would manage the uh, the production crews and help them with their photography and their and their videography, um, yeah. So just lots of lots of photo and video. That's really cool. Um, so these before and after photos that you're taking are these the kind of things that we would see like in the in a in a company's brand box assets that that, that they will go out to the practice once they become a customer of that brand. Is it that kind of thing or definitely the Abelis stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. everything Abelis, uh I shot all that. Um, but like I say in the in the lookbooks, you know, I remember I was at an office to set it up, and uh, I was waiting in the waiting room, and I looked through one of the Allergan books, and I was like, oh, I shot them. That's that was not intended to be there, but you know, they use it. It was because everything I shot, even on the Voluma tour over two years, it was fast, go, go, go. But I had my system down to where they were beautiful photos. I mean, they were awesome. And so they started using them in these lookbooks that they were handing out to practices. That's cool. That's a cool story. Kind of how, and then how you wound up here seeing this need yeah, for building these custom photo booths. You told me something right before we started rolling, which I thought was interesting. And I love, you, I didn't let you tell me the whole thing because I wanted to hear about it live here on the podcast. But you mentioned kind of a pivot you did with one of your carts during the pandemic. Will you tell us about that? Yeah. Yeah. So we had, uh, with Revance, we had a, a really big um, campaign that we were going to work on, and that was a 121 shoot days uh, in the year. And as you know, that's a that's a big lift. So it was going to be me and my team traveling around the U.S. doing the same trainings that we did, basically the same format, where it's it's one trainer training six doctors. They bring their own patient, and it was going to be documenting that and then doing video as well. Well, lockdowns happened, um, and that whole project got squished completely. Well, my shuttle pro that you saw the the, the cart, mm -hmm. um, I I quickly needed to pivot and and still help my client out. I still wanted to help them train everybody, and I realized that we could do that simply by just running a Zoom call. So initially, I thought we can still we can have the laptop and connect to the uh, DSLR, but if we take it a step further and we put a PTZ camera, which is a pan tilt zoom camera, like one of those security cameras, mm -hmm. we mount it to that. And then we can plug that in to the laptop and then we're set. So now we can zoom with anybody and we can capture anything. So uh, to the, to date, I think we have around 20, 21 of these units around the U.S. and they're training um, full time. They're basically telemedicine devices. They are big telemedicine devices. So we've got top light, bottom light, camera in the middle, a confidence monitor so the doctor can see their shot. They can see who they're talking to, a uh, wireless mic. And, and they're able to communicate and train people anywhere, anytime they want to. So we, we have some doctors that, you know, they'll do like say eight trainings a month and others that'll do 50 a month, that sort of thing. So it's a, it's, it's a way to reach out and get around the world. Yeah, I think that was a cool, a cool pivot in the pandemic to yeah. go, hey, I, I have something that could be pretty quickly turned into a telemedicine device, which we all needed more than ever. Yeah. Telemedicine yeah. during that time. Yeah, that was, you know, everybody had to go video. You know, I hadn't been using Zoom a, a little bit before that. That's why I was even aware of it. It was like, oh, we're using Zoom now for our meetings and all this stuff. And I thought, well, let's just do this and really just tap into telemedicine, but make it a training device. So now these training devices are working really well. Smart. I never saw a faster shift in technological adoption than, than yeah. that. Because we used to try to do Zoom video calls with all of our surgeon clients yeah. all the time. And it would be... 10 minutes of kind of trying to figure it out. Video's not working out. I'm on the, I'm in the practice. We don't have a webcam on here right. on these computers. Yeah. Okay, never mind. Let's just do phone. And then I'll now fast forward. 
it's like second nature. You know, yeah. everybody has the, the equipment. Everybody knows how to use it. Everybody knows how to use Zoom now. Yeah. So tying into that, this is a, I'll leave you here because I want to. I know it's been a long day here. You'll probably be. I'll let you get out and enjoy Miami. Good. This is totally a little bit off subject, but since you've been in this industry for a long time, and we're talking about technological adoptions and changes, I'm curious to pick your brain on what you see coming when it comes to AI in media production. Yeah. And now I know it's. I, okay. I'm just. I'll. I'll preface this with, we we have a media department, and it's actually we're, we're creating a, a media, a separate media company out of that, and our. Our head of our media department, Jonathan, and I, and also our my business partners, we talk a lot about how these things are coming to change. AI, particularly, is right up in the forefront right now. Right. But there's some really fascinating things in audio processing with that Adobe's doing with AI um, and in media production. And I just kind of went on a deep dive myself recently to look at some of the technology that's out there. It's kind of staggering. You can clone people's voices. Mm -hmm. um, there's programs like Descript that are doing crazy editing capability. I mean, there's so many of them that are using AI-powered Particularly, I see it in the workflows and post-production. Yeah. And then there's generative AI that eventually, they say, like, we're going to be able to, certain interviews and stuff, I read, you know, text to video um, will come. And it will, and within 10 to 15 years, it'll be a, you'll be able to write, yeah. write text and have a, a Hollywood-level production right. created yeah. from nothing uh, but text. Although, yeah, I'll, I'll stop there and get your input. I have more to say. Well, I... Yeah, you probably have way more on this than I do. Okay. I've just started to, I guess, accept this idea. Right, it is an acceptance factor. And then start to look into it. And I actually told my son, I'm like, hey, will you please start looking into this okay. for me? Yeah. Just understand how much does it cost to yeah. to, to use it? I don't even know how to use it. Sure. I, you know, or chat GPT. I know, but you're but, technologically savvy and you would get there. But it is acceptance. I believe that that's yeah. true. First, you have yeah. to kind of bring the wall down. Yeah, and that's it, is yeah. the wall, because I, I have the wall up. It's like, man, do I really want to learn another technology? Yeah. You know, I've, I've mastered Adobe. Okay, I'm good. But do I really want to move on to that? And then I, it's just, it's accepting it and then putting it into your workflow. But there, it seems like there's going to be some pretty amazing and scary things that are going to happen with it. Yeah. I think we're all, we've all thought, eh, how good could AI be when we've been hearing rumors of and tremblings of it for for the last few years. And now I think we're all realizing, oh, it's going to change things. Yeah. Um, I'll share some things with you that I found. And there's a founder of an, a company who did a podcast and he's the one creating some of this technology. And he, he gave one interesting perspective that I'll share for here and then we'll leave it at that. Yeah. Which is that if you go back a certain amount of years ago, it would have been unfathomable to think that you could create every instrument virtually, which you can now. He said like on the side, he kind of hobbies, his hobby is he's a, he's a music producer, DJ. Right. It's this guy who's creating who's creating AI video, generative AI video. Right. And he said, and now we can do that. We, I have every instrument packed in my computer. They're VSTs, virtual instruments. But we still play guitar. We still play piano. And we we long for that kind of analog thing. Um, and that even when when you'll be able to have text to video that ha comes out with of a Hollywood level production, he said, it's going to be its own class of media. And people will always still know, this is what he says, that it's not the same kind right. of media. Right. It's just its own category of media, and it's similar truth. People like EDM, dance music, but they, you know, whatever, electronic music, but they're still going to want to listen to a great musician play an analog instrument. Yeah. I think that's an interesting take, and I'll also say as I analyze it and marketing, the need for video, uh, even if you could create it out of thin air, it doesn't really do much for a, co for a potential consumer who's looking at this video to vet this business and how authentic they are right. if they know that it was generated by AI. So there's always going to be a need for media that's actually authentic. I, I totally agree. Yeah. And and I had this conversation uh, a couple of days ago. It's it's like the transition that we went from film to digital cameras and then digital cameras to iPhones, mm -hmm. where us as photographers, and you probably went through this, is it's like, whoa, wait a second. Everybody can take a beautiful photo with a phone? Our jobs are done. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't the case. You know, everybody kind of jumped to this conclusion that like our, our, our careers are at risk. But then we quickly realized like, you have to understand all the fundamentals of photography and lighting and, and, and distance composition to, to, to effectively communicate what your client wants to see of, for final product. So I think you're, you're spot on with the AI is that you will see this signature AI look. And maybe that's a genre that people want to see and they, 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 they seek it out. Oh, I want to see all the new AI movies that have been created this week. But when it comes to what we do is producing um there's that that human touch that will be on there that i don't think you can get from ai i don't think 
you know, we'll see where it goes. But even even still, I think even if it will then become an ethical question of whether you're misleading people by not telling them that it's AI. And for marketing, you need they need to know that it's the real deal. Otherwise, what's the point? You can should it be watermarked? Yeah, well, that's a whole other thing. AI. Yeah. 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 And the subject, the subject of of this, uh, you know, authorship, right, is going to become really interesting. And it, there's so much to be said. But I think short term, we're uh, the subject of providence. That's what I was looking for. Is going to become really interesting. Which is, you know, who is it created by and and um, who owns it and all of these things. It's going to get fascinating. Totally. Digital rights management has always been kind of an interesting subject, and it's going to continue to really evolve rapidly. This week, there were some crazy things with music. Mm-hmm. An AI created song that was mimicking artists, Drake and The Weeknd, and Google took it off YouTube because the record label, I forget which label it was, came in and said, and they used their voices to create it. We're going to see a whole new world of trademarking all that. In the short term, though, I think we can embrace the fact that it's actually going to do a lot in post-production workflows. That's what mm-hmm. I, I know. Yeah. And and we, we might balk at that at first, but actually in the end, like you said, there's so many things that have come before that have just made life easier. And at first it seems scary, but actually now we can't even imagine if we have to go tediously. What if we still have to, you know, yeah. cut film, splice film, yeah. you know? Wait, well, you remember Napster, that. right? I do. Napster came in and disrupted everything. Yeah. And that's kind of the same thing. It's like, wait a second, you're making it sound like me? You know, Drake and making a- Yeah, yeah, yeah. so it is the same thing. It's piracy of another kind. It's piracy of another level. And then this is going to be an uproar and everybody, hey, hold up. You can't go creating stuff that sounds like me. And you're so right that it's really analogous to what happened, the uproar after Napster. Yeah. It's yeah. really just like that because these are this this is off the internet now. There was a few other people who posted on a YouTube reposted. I noticed those are gone too. So it's huh. kind of quiet now. But this song, by the way, is good. <laughs> and it's written entirely by AI. Yeah. It's not just cloning their voice. It was written by AI. The beat, the lyrics, the rhyme, the rap, the voice. Yeah. Was that chat line of mind blowing was it that specific? i don't know the ai engine that did it but i don't think so because chat gpt is really focused right now just around yeah i don't know that there there's a way to leverage chat gpt's engine to make music and vocals yeah. and things like that not, not that yeah. i'm aware of. well i've heard the uh comedians that you can write through chat gpt you can uh was it joe rogan you can you can set it up for uh louis ck but with a joe rogan flair yeah, yeah. you can just twist and yeah. manipulate whatever you want and then and they, he did a uh, an example of uh, Mitch Hedberg. So they typed it in, do a Mitch Hedberg, which he's passed on, and uh, and the AI came up with the whole bit, and it sounded exactly like what Mitch Hedberg would have said. He and this is heard. this is just the written word, or it's actually. I think they typed in, and they just typed in make make a bit that yeah. uh, that Mitch. Would... But what we're seeing output is written words, or do they actually have a voice? Yeah, it's in audio. It sounded like him. It was everything. Yeah. Yeah, it's Crazy. weird. Yeah, okay. it's, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be, yeah. that's one thing we know for sure. Anyway, I just wanted to pick your brain on that. As someone yeah. who's been doing this, clearly knows what they're doing, been at it a long time. I just thought I'd we'd add that little segment on, so I appreciate it. But thank you so much for coming and yeah, thanks. Thanks sharing your story. Really, really cool. And we're definitely going to be talking more about awesome. how we can connect you with some of our clients that need your services. Yeah, love it. Okay, thanks, thanks so much, man. My pleasure. It.